Hello, welcome to the John Hewitt International Summer School 2020. Because of the pandemic, we're not in the location we hope to be, which is the lovely Marketplace Theatre in Armagh. But with the magic of technology, we're coming to you uh, online. And thanks to our funders, the Arts Council and Armagh City, Banbridge and Craig Avon Borough Council. So it's my very great pleasure to introduce you to a much loved author, Marita Conlon McKenna. My name is Martina Devlin, I'm also a writer and Marita and I have known each other a great many years so it's such a thrill to talk to her today. We'll be talking about Marita's latest novel, The Hungry Road. She's back in great famine territory with it. Um, Marita has been uh, delighting several generations of readers, children and adults with her fiction. Um, and Marita, welcome. Hi, Martina. Um, thank you so much for doing the interview today. It's a shame we're not in the market theatre. I was in it in February in Armagh. It's a beautiful theatre, but um, doing it like this, it'll work well with the two of us. So instead yeah. of sitting beside each other, we're in different places, but still, still, still having our chat. Not too far apart. Marita, your latest novel, The Hungry Road, is a famine novel. You first came to attention as a writer, writing about the famine, but for children under the hawthorn tree, which gave rise to a trilogy. Yeah, the first book came out actually 30 years ago, Under the Hawthorn Tree. This was in year? May. Yeah, the anniversary was in May, 23rd of May. That date is very special to me. And um, that was when Under the Hawthorn Tree first came out and was published. The small little book, which... I never expected it to be published and um, took me, took my publishers and I think took booksellers by surprise um, because it just, I think children and teachers and readers took it to their heart. And before uh, we knew it, this little book had become a very big book, which has been read and read and read um, over the decades um, by, I don't know, a generation of Irish children. And well, two parents. generations, probably. <laughs> yeah, yeah, few, yeah, actually, yeah, really. I wrote it for my daughter and my little granddaughter has read it as well now. She's 12. So it's it's gone, it's gone to two generations now. And it is um, a very special book. I'm very proud of it. Uh, but like that, it was set during the Great Irish Famine and... And it was a very simple story about three children who um, were trying to survive the famine and lived in a small little place called Dunene. And um, their father had gone off to work on the roads and their mother went to find him because their little sister had died. And then the three of them are evicted from their cottage where well, they're actually going to be sent to the workhouse with their neighbours from the area, and which did happen. And what happened, they decided they didn't want to go to the workhouse because um, in the workhouse, children uh, were separated. So boys and girls were separated. Mothers and children were separated. Fathers and children were separated. So they didn't want to be separated. These three children were very close to sisters and a brother, Eileen, Michael and Peggy. And they decided to make this ama amazing journey trek across Ireland at the height of a ravaged, um, ravaged land during the famine to try and find these ants they'd heard about from, the, from their mother who lived miles and miles away from where they were. And um, in a way, they were like witnesses going through the land and seeing what happened during the famine. So it was very simply written. Nature, um, I suppose even like a magic element came into it when I was writing it and about how these children would survive. And uh, But I never expected when I wrote that story, I wrote it, I wrote it very quickly. I wrote in 12 weeks that that book would have such an impact um, on me as a writer and also on um, other people who read it and loved it. And such an impact it has really, I suppose, in helping so many people to get some understanding of the great Irish famine of the great hunger and what it has done to Ireland and how we as a people how it has changed us and made us the people we are nowadays. So that was 30 years ago when you decided to tell this really grim story. <laughs> yeah. 30 years on why did you go back to it for adults with the hungry road? 
Well, I had written, when I wrote, wrote Under the Hawthorn Tree, then I followed those children. I, I, the next book, I brought Peggy to America. I followed the journey of the immigrants. And then I went back a few years later and wrote Fields of Home, which followed um, the change in land ownership in Ireland. But those books are written for, for young people, for children. Not that so many adults have read the books. And um, apparently all the bookshops, when tourists come to Ireland, they say, I want to read about Irish history. They give them the trilogy to read, which is very nice. And it's been read all around the world. And I never, ever intend to go back into it. Um, my publisher has pleaded with me to do another children's book on the series. But I do think the trilogy works very, very well. And I, I don't think you should um, mess with something that works really, really well because it's like Father Ted, a limited number of things are made and it works at 40 towers, it works well. So um, I was tempted to do that. And then what happened, um, I had written Rebel Sisters, which was a really big novel about the 1916 rising by the Gifford family the Jeffords sisters, and um, their part in the rising. And it was a really, really big book. And as you know, I swore to you, even yourself, I would never do a big historical novel again. You said you'd had enough. <laughs> I'd had enough after all the research of 1916 in that period. And then what happened, I got this, this idea. It's awful for me because I get these ideas and I can't put them out of my brain. And I got this really strong idea. And it started off that it was this a barren piece of land and a broken down cottage overlooking the Atlantic. And um, I kept seeing this pitch in my mind and I, I, like touching me and saying, I want you to write about this. And I said, I've already written about another cottage and another family. And they said, this is a different story. And um, I began to think it was going to be a past and present novel. And it was going to be somebody in present time inherited this old famine land and cottage or bought it. And then they would come to Ireland to explore the story. And then the story would be told like an adult famine, famine story. But then as I began to research it, I lost interest with the present part of it, which was, you know, that th these people coming over from America, reclaiming their roots or whatever. And I began to concentrate on, on the actual cottage in the Atlantic. And then I knew I was writing about West Cork, which is where my family are from, and writing about Skibreen, where my mother grew up. And um, the really linchpin moment for me was say, how can I make this a story that will work on the page and be different and you know, engage me because the story has to engage me as a writer first. So I'm obsessed with it and I want to do it long before it ever will ever engage or, or a reader. If it doesn't engage me and hold my attention, forget it. I'm not going to write that book. But I began to research. And when I was in Skibreen, even though I've been in Skibreen, I know practically every year since I've been a child, um, I actually discovered about this local doctor called Dr. Dan Donovan. And there's a place called the Skibreen Heritage Centre, which has a lot of things about the famine. It has a famine exhibit you can go around. And when I started to research about Dr. Dan Donovan, the local doctor at the time who lived in Skibreen, and he was the dispensary doctor, but was also the, um, the doctor for the workhouse. And the workhouse had only opened just before the famine in West Cork and Skibreen. The famine and, uh, was 1845, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, and it opened, it, it opened before, a few years before that. And he was running this workhouse. And um, when I started reading what he wrote, and his, he kept this diary of a dispensary doctor writing down the height of the famine, what was happening in the workhouse and in the town. And this was published, this diary, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was published in the newspapers, first of all in Cork, then throughout Ireland, then it was picked up by some of the British newspapers and even went to Europe and to America. So, so it was published as he was writing at Marita? Did people yeah, know yeah, it was published. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was published. Was and, really? um, yeah. and this was incredible because this was a first-hand witness mm -hmm to what was going on, which is actually quite rare during the famine to have a first-hand witness accounting what's happened when he goes into the workhouse, when he goes into a cottage, when he walks the lanes. So um, this was an incredible, um, you know, moment when you're right, when you find something like this and you say, this is a first-hand witness who's telling me something and tell talking to me. And what I was he saying in the diary? It, it was, it, his description of what was happening, and it was quite clear, you could feel this, um, he was a very intelligent man, a very good man, and you could feel his, you know, the, the, the whole bureaucracy of the time, and, and people didn't seem to realise what was happening in Ireland, and down in West Cork, and all around, kind of what it's now, the wild Atlantic way, the coast, that, that coastline, that how bad things were. And he was actually trying to make people realise that 
help has to come. We cannot survive this. And you could feel his um, railing against the stu stupid bureaucracy of what he had to do. He was doing autopsies on people who died of starvation were found on the side of the road after the roadworks. And um, you know, cutting open these bodies and seeing there was no food in the, in the stomachs, there was no body fat at all on the bodies. And I you know it sounds very gruesome, but... In a way, like, I just felt, you know, this cannot be ignored. This has to be, I know academics know about it, but I said ordinary people mm -hmm. don't know the story. And I'm just and hoping the they might be interested the way I was, you know. What was the response to this diary of a dispensary doctor, as it was called? Oh, there was huge response to it because what happened when that was published in the papers was read by everybody. And then actually what happened was... Um, uh, they they were really, really reacted to this. And then what happened then, the papers, other people came then after reading this to, to investigate what was happening. And, um, you know, it really brought attention of Skibreen and West Cork and my whole district to to look to London to everywhere, and it um, make a difference. I mean, people still it, died. It did. And then what happened then? Um, this this artist was sent. James Mahoney was sent from the paper. One of the papers had picked it up, and he was an illustrator. And James Mahoney came to um, Skibreen, and Dr. Donovan showed him around and brought him with him. And Doc, uh, James Mahoney had his sketch pad out, and he did these amazing sketches and drawings, which are kind of the iconic um, things we see now to do with the famine because there wasn't any photographs at the time. So he, these, um, James Mahoney sh you know, came and Dr. Dan brought him around. So you have the words of Dr. Dan and James Mahoney's own words because he also wrote what he saw and he was very upset by what he saw too with, with Dr. Donovan bringing him around and Donovan bringing him around. So that brought attention. And then those illustrations, of course, then went all across the world um, as well and were picked up. So it really put huge pressure on, on the government in Westminster and on politics in England because the ordinary people, they began actually, British Relief Association, they began to contribute to help Ireland. But, um, you know, Parliament wasn't, they felt that Ireland had to get out of this themselves and the landlords had to help themselves. And Daniel O'Connell, the great liberator, who, who at the start of the book visits Skibreen, he had a massive monster meeting in Skibreen in 1843, just before the famine. And Daniel O'Connell goes and begs and pleads in Westminster for help for the starving Irish, like really, really pleads for help and says, if you don't, they're all going to die. And of course, um, it's terrible because Daniel O'Connell, it, it, nothing happens. They just don't even hardly listen to him or acknowledge what he's pleading, what he wants for Ireland. And heartbroken then, he, he's actually sick at the time, he's old, and he actually travels then. He tries to aim to go to Italy, to Rome, to plead with the Pope, but unfortunately he dies on the way though eventually his heart goes to Rome and his body comes back to Ireland. But um, Daniel O'Connell is another figure through the book, Dan, Dr. Dan Donovan, Daniel O'Connell, because Daniel O'Connell was an iconic person at, at that period in Ireland as well. I suppose I'm puzzling slightly, Marita. You had these people doing illustrations, writing reports of the famine, and yet people were still dying in their tens of thousands. Yeah. You know, the message was delivered. Yeah. But it didn't register. Well, what happened was also like even at Justice of the Peace came from Cork, um, Nicholas Commons, and he he was appalled. Dr. Dan Donovan showed him around as well. And his letter, he sent out to the Duke of Wellington, which was actually published in Christmas Eve in, on the Times in England. And apparently upset so many people that they're having their Christmas dinner to read about Ireland, how the state of the place. But, you know, um, I think there was a great... Um, I don't know, animosity against Ireland and Irish. And we were, they seemed to think that people were lazy, they were dependent, they wouldn't help themselves. And um, they, they just, you know, but then eventually they were pushed by public opinion to start donating and, um, you know, to give something to Ireland. But be long before that happened, Dr. Dan Donovan, they'd set up a committee, um, a, a relief committee in, in Skibreen because the situation was so bad for Skibreen and that whole district and Dr. Dan was seeing the results of it in the workhouse, which was becoming overcrowded with people trying to get in and they couldn't fit any more people in eventually and people were getting sick. And they set up this relief committee. And then when no help was really forthcoming, um, 
Dr. Dan and the local businessmen in Skip Green, the local solicitor, the local banker, they actually opened a soup kitchen themselves in an old mill, in a mill, well, it was a new mill at the time. And they opened the first big soup kitchen, um, which was organised in Skip Green. And um, the British government didn't open a, a soup kitchen in Ireland until months and months later. So that soup kitchen they set up, before that, people were doing the roadworks. And to get any money, they had to do hard labour on the roadworks. Which With no food in their stomach. Nothing in their stomach. Of course, they were dying. They were getting sick. They were collapsing. It was the worst winter on record with snow and terrible, terrible weather. People were dying of exposure as well. But um, the, the Relief Committee in Skibreen, they kind of knew if they set up um, a soup ki- kitchen, people had to, they had no money to pay for it. It had to be free. There, could be, there was no thing you had to be this or you had to be that to come to the soup kitchen. It was free. Once you signed up for it, you got a ticket. You got a ticket every day to come. Like people had to walk miles. And um, as I said, the weather was atrocious. Later on, they did start bringing soup out to the further districts. But at the time, there was just the main soup kitchen in Skibreen at the beginning. And, uh, but that probably saved all those men who came together and women in that town saved, I don't know how many lives by setting up a soup kitchen and acting ahead of everybody else, which just shows the incredible spirit of Dr. Dan and all those local people in Skibreen to actually do that. So I think, I thought it was such a big story that the minute I started reading all this and researching it, I said, you know, no one really knows the story. And I think people will be hooked because we often think of the famine and people who died in the famine or even survived as victims that they didn't fight back. And he said, why didn't they fight back? Why didn't they do anything? But they did. And the people actually on the roadworks, which I was really surprised when I researched it, um, they rioted. They were not, they're not, not even being paid. They're meant to be paid every day or every few days. But I don't know, there was some mix up with bureaucracy again um, and politics that they didn't get paid. And so like, Thousands of men marched into Skip Green looking for payment because they had no food. They're working on empty stomachs. Their children were starving. Their wives were starving. And they, you know, they actually rioted and came into town. And they went into other towns in the locality as well, begging for it to be paid for payment for the work and uh, were appeased. But like, so it, they certainly did not lie down and die and I wanted I wanted um, my readers and Irish people and people who are interested in the famine to know that um, you know the perception we have of the famine um, is actually very different from the reality and in actual fact the reality it's, uh, it's terrible to say is actually way worse than even I who has been talking about the famine for years could have imagined it's that the reality that was actually worse than I had even though I've been talking about it for years, had imagined. And I wanted people to realise the enormity of the situation Ireland was facing and um, how Irish people themselves fought so hard. Irish politicians, um, you know, and then we had, you know, the likes of Dan Donovan. And I'm sure there were doctors and priests and committees all around Ireland and towns trying to save the people, you know. I mean, but Skibreen was the epic, epic centre of it and um, the work that, that Dr Dan and those other people in the town did was just amazing. There was a, a Father Fitzmorris as well, who was a real figure. Whom you right, picked. Father Fitzpatrick, yeah. He, right. and he, and he wrote as well. He wrote about it and he dealt with it. And then as well, they had to, what, what, one of the big things the church had to deal with is that um, people were dying and then they couldn't have funerals. And I mean, we have something a little bit similar here at the moment with the COVID that people couldn't have proper funerals. But of course, this was when Ireland was in such a, a grip of Catholicism that not to have a funeral was seen was seen as absolutely terrible. So there was After, fear of infection, is that it? Yeah, well they had they had to bury That's the they didn't, they didn't really understand infection the way we would understand infection now, but they just knew that there were so many people dying they had to bury them and there wasn't coffins. But, you know, there weren't there wasn't enough um people to make coffins, such was the extent of it. They couldn't make coffins quick enough. And also coffins were too expensive. And sometimes a few people in a family would die. And of course they all wanted to be buried. So um, they had a cart that used to collect people and uh, and that was across Ireland, they did that too. So for the priests to be dealing with a, a, you know, a group of people, a society or a town or a district who had such a belief in their power to help and assist them and and the priests I mean it was I mean a lot of priests actually got sick and died themselves you know too as well as doctors and and people working in the workhouses 
but um, staff in the workhouses. So they had an enormous task ahead of them to try and, um, you know, work out with what they should do with all these bodies and how they could have a decent burial. And so they, they built these pits in the graveyard in Skipperine which you can see and Abistruri it's where my grandmother's actually buried and they were buried in these pits and it's now a national famine monument Abistruri graveyard where these pits where hundreds and hundreds or thousands of people are buried in Skibreen. It's actually a very serene place I visited it just outside Skibreen town. It's beautiful it's haunting when you go there there is an atmosphere and every time I go down to West Cork I always go there I don't I can never I've never found my grandmother's grave because I think it's all grown over or faded or whatever but um it's beautiful it's overlooking the river and they have this beautiful sculpture have you seen the sculpture yeah. Martina? beautiful sculpture overlooking the river of a reclining figure always lying down which is almost like a fallen figure um and so but it's the most peaceful spot or and the most beautiful and this is it's one of the things that got me down in, in, in West Cork. And if you go around the whole you know, Atlantic Way, as they call it now, these are the most beautiful places in Ireland. And most beautiful scenic places, rich in natural beauty, and um, you know, rich in good farmland that can grow and all this kind of stuff. And yet, um, such devastation to happen there. And then, you know, the people to be driven out, often evicted, leaving this land behind that, you know, nothing was on it, only animals, you know, cows or sheep or whatever, eventually replaced people there. And that was a kind of thing I found very hard. I felt Dr. Don Dr. Donovan would have been riding around on his horse, visiting people and seeing how, you know, all the land was cleared and then all was left was these animals, on was animals, you know. So it was really strange. And I just felt um, as a, a doctor and an intelligent man him going around and witnessing this, it was just an incredible opportunity to write about him and to um, use his, and I tried to just literally use his words and you know, not put words in his mouth, but use his words and, and communicate what, what um, he saw and what happened, you know. The famine, well, of course, there were a number of famines, the, the great hunger, Gortha Moore, it has a grip, really, on the national consciousness, doesn't it? It's a scar. It is. Of course it has, and it always will have. And um, um, it, it just is, it's such a part of our history, um, this huge um, you know, rupture in, in, in our lives that, that changed everything, that, that you know, first of all, you know, annihilated so many people. And I've also left people who were so, um, they were so joined to the land. Irish people were so joined to the land. And to lose that land, whether it is, you know, just within their own country or actually have to go on a ship to another country, that was an awful break in what Irish people had hoped for and planned for and imagined. They would never have imagined the scale of amount of people who would have had to emigrate um, at such a level and leave the place, you know, where they had such roots, you know, and they may not have owned the land, but they had been tenants on that land for maybe hundreds of years. And they, you know, it was just devastating to, um, to families you know, generations of families to have this, you know, this land taken from them and gone and that the land had failed and the potatoes had failed them. It was absolutely incredible. And that's when I was writing it then. I wanted to reflect also the tenants and in the Sullivan family, um, you know, they were just the average tenants who had a young family and Mary Sullivan and her husband, John, and who were trying to just eke out a living on this land. And of course, when the potatoes failed, they were destroyed almost, you know. Marita, how do you write about something so harrowing and then just go back to normal life? I don't know. I'm, I'm drawn to big stories. I don't know why, but most of my books are big stories. And uh, I think I have big happy stories. I know, I've, I've written stories. some very happy stories too. I do write happy stories. <laughs> and usually actually my books always have a happy ending at the end, even though they might go through. Ter- like the end of Hungry Road, there is a good ending. Now it's, you know, uh, not a happy big pink ribbon kind of happy ending, but there is a good outcome to the story. The Sullivans go to America, and Doctor Dan is back in Skibreen. But um, no, I'm just drawn to these stories, and I suppose when I'm writing the beginning of the book, I'm you know, having kind of a normal life and writing. But as I get deeper into the book, I have I do find, especially a book like um, like Hungry Road like Under the Hawthorn Tree, like Rebel Sisters, I find myself um, not really seeing people, not 
going out and doing things because I'm just focused on that story. I'm in that period in my head and I find hard, I wouldn't be reading fiction or anything at that time. I'd be just concentrating on the book and just trying to, you know, have a normal life but be writing as much as I can because I spend a lot of the time here in my study where, I, where we were being filmed at writing and I, I like that. Do you feel a sense of additional responsibility when you're fictionalizing someone who really lived like Dr. Dan and like the Liberator? Oh my God, yeah. The, the amount of research you have to do to make sure it's right and checking and fact checking. But I do feel, um, I mean, I felt with Dr. Dan Donovan, you know, um, there is a plaque to him in the Heritage Centre in Skibreen. Um, but I just felt he had been overlooked by by history. And I felt, you know, this very decent, good man deserved recognition. Mm -hmm. And I did feel, I just felt he, you know, he deserved to be the hero of a story because to me, what he did was heroic, absolutely heroic. He had a wife His and young children. Too, didn't she? Yeah. But I felt he was a hero and I felt he was very good. And I'd always had a thing about Daniel O'Connell. And, you know, from reading about him and, you know, learning about him when I was in school and history. And I really felt um, when I read about him coming to Skibreen and um, there's this big field and he had the meeting there. And, and I read about all these thousands and thousands. Some people, there was up to 80,000 people came to see him. Somewhere between 60 and 80,000 um, and in Curra Hill. And I was like, this is amazing. Like, I, I never knew that. And imagine this, you know, Skibreen was very prosperous at this, before the famine and this prosperous town with Daniel O'Connell who would have been like a superstar at the time coming to talk to people and everybody rushing to the town and packing into the town to see him and you know and then then how he tried to when the famine happened he was you know in Dublin trying to get help and um, with the Lord Lieutenant he was with Parliament trying to get help and um, he wasn't well himself and um, you know so I I just felt he's kind of it's funny too, Daniels, Dan Donovan and Daniel O'Connell had both been kind of a little bit, you know, overlooked. And I really wanted, I thought having him come to Skip Ring and showing the town pre-famine when everything was going well and when hope was in the air and Irish people felt, you know, Ireland would get back some of its rights. And um, that was a great starting point. So I, Daniel O'Connell goes through the book too. So I just felt to give these real people, um, you know, their due for what they've done. Uh, and of course, then, you know, they had the Sullivans who, OK, there was a family called the Sullivans, but I don't know a lot of details about them. So I had far more freedom writing about um, the Sullivans than about the other real people in the town. You know, you know the, the bank manager, the, the the lawyer, who were all on record and all, you know, on record in Skibreen. You can find all, all about them, you know. Well, you can't change what happened when it's true events. No, you can't. No, no. The iceberg out of the Titanic's way. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't. So, uh, up to a point, you know, when it's fictional characters, you can change their outcomes. Yeah, well, with 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 Mary Sullivan, there was a family called Tenant uh, called the Sullivans, and there were tenants, and I tracked them. But actually, the really big thing with Mary Sullivan, I did was because they're devastated when they, you know, they lose their potato crop, and they know, and um, what's going to happen to them. But um, I suddenly got a picture of her. I was trying to picture her in my head. And I suddenly had her with a little needle. And I said, what the hell is this little needle for, you know? And she's she's a seamstress. And before she married John, um, when I researched Skipper in town, there were all these um, dressmakers in the town, which was a prosperous town. And people would come into Skipper in and get, women would get their fashion, the clothes made of the latest fashion at the time. And um, the minute I... I will, I put her working as a seamstress with Honora, who was, you know, dressmaker in the town. The minute I put that needle in her hand, I knew I had an extra line of the story I could build into it. And it's funny, that little needle, like it wasn't a spade, it wasn't a gun, it wasn't a knife. It was the tiniest of implements. But in a way, that tiny little implement, that little silver needle would save their lives and save her family and it was the tiniest tiniest of things and often it's the tiniest of things when you're writing that you don't expect I never expected that I never planned that but once I actually put that little needle in her hand that needle would take her out of Skibreen would take her across the ocean would take her to New York would take her to you know able to provide for 
family in New York. So um, it was amazing how one tiny needle, a needle in a haystack literally, would change um, outcomes. So you've told the famine story for children and for adults. Is there a difference to the way you build the narrative, depending on that audience? Well, I think, um, obviously, when you're writing for children, a book is a lot shorter and it's much easier and you, it's very, very simple. And, and also, I find writing for children, you have to have as little clutter as possible because children hate very cluttered books. And most children don't like very cluttered books. And also, I'm very conscious when I write that I'm writing for children who are really good readers, but I'm also writing for a load of children who are hopeless readers and hardly ever read a book but you know want to read a book and I'm trying to build a story that will catch them and hold them and go fast and speed along at a good pace so in a way having written for children for so many years um it's a really good because it taught me how to write really simply and um, calmly and um, hold attention you know grab emotions and um, you know involve a child in a book and bring them into the story the way I as a writer when I'm writing I feel I'm in the story and you learn an awful lot then when you're writing for children because you learn how to write the clearest form of writing it's a huge privilege to write for children and for children to read your books and you know to make you learn to be a better writer and so in a way, I suppose I've learned an awful lot from writing for children and I still learn from that. And in a way, it has helped me with writing for adults because I think in a way, a lot of my writing isn't very cluttered still. And um, I don't go into mass, like I go into the details I need to go into, but I don't clutter with stuff I don't need to. And um, with, with, when I, with the new book, Hungry Road, I was very careful. I didn't want big romances. I didn't want peasants being whipped by landlords or anything like that. I didn't want all those cliche things that people would put in a big famine novel. So I wanted to keep it very simple. Focus on these people in the town. Focus on the doctor, the priest, the locals, and the, the tenant family. So I wanted the same kind of uncluttered because the family is such a big story, I didn't need to clutter it with other big romances and things. I didn't want to clutter it with anything like that or big landlords and, 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 and kind of servant, you know, um, big fights or things like that. I wanted to show what was happening. So I think I, I learned a lot from writing under the Hawthorne Tree and, and all my children's books and has stood me in very good stead. I mean, obviously the research element in a novel like, um, you know, The Hungry Road is enormous. But the Heritage Centre in Skibreen and, and just other, other avenues of researching the famine were all open to me. And I used them and grabbed any help I could get and assistance. I could grab it and use it. And uh, so the research element is huge, but it's really the story and it's the writing of the story and telling it in a way that I'm engaged and that I'm hoping my readers will be engaged too. And that's a really a lesson as a writer you have to learn. And even though I've been writing now for 30 years, I'm still learning that lesson, Martina. I'm still trying to learn that lesson more and keep going and keep writing. Because to me, writing is all important. As you know, I'm just always writing. You know, I don't take breaks from writing. I'm always writing. Well, you're a natural born storyteller, Marita, definitely. Um, well, and of course, this is a novel really about endurance and the human Third. Spirit, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Would you read us a bit? I go to one up. The part I'm going to read you is um, during the famine. What happened in 1845? It's when the the potatoes failed, and it was terrible all across Ireland. The potatoes failed. In some parts, 50% of the crop failed. In other parts, 25%. In Skibbereen, I think somewhere between 50 and 70% of the crops failed in, in certain areas. And so the Sullivans have, have lost their first crop. And the town is aware of, you know, things have really got bad. Um, but it's teetering. And then the summer of 1846, everybody has replanted their potato fields. And they're full of hope that this new crop will come in. And that, um, you know, the, the the first time when the potatoes failed, you know, animals were sold, possessions were sold, everything was gone to get them through until the summer of 1846. And unfortunately, the summer of 1846, um, the exact same thing happens again, but on a massive scale with n nothing surviving, that the, 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 they can't believe this um, the fungus comes back and kills all the potatoes. And so nothing to sell this time. You no, know, nothing to sell. So this is just Mary, um, Mary Sullivan, who's one of the, my hero, my, my heroine of the book, um, you know, 
they've gone out, they've dug every bit of every ridge, every drill of potatoes, and nothing has survived. And they're absolutely devastated. And the same with all their neighbours. Hold up the cover so we can see your lovely cover. Oh, can you see it? Yes, lovely, lovely. Yeah. Chapter 15. Mary Sullivan stared out her family's devastated land and the stinking acres all around them, unable to believe that such a calamity had befallen them again. In the bright morning sunlight, things looked worse. The foul stench still hung in the air and the drills were filled with the rotting mass of stalks and potatoes where they had dug and laboured the previous day. How in God's name would they survive this? All night John had trashed and turned beside her in the bed, restless yet exhausted. The children still lay asleep, curled up on their rough blankets like little mice. Tears welled in Mary's eyes as she surveyed, surveyed everything the blight had taken from them. This time it had left them with nothing, nothing to eat, nothing to sell or pay their rent with. A deep fear of what lay ahead gripped her heart. She and John no longer had a purse of hidden money, not even a penny or a shilling to call their own. Everything had depended on raising this new potato crop. She watched the smoke begin to curl from the neighbours' chimneys as people began to rise and process the full extent of the catastrophe wreaked upon them. From what she could see, nobody has escaped the destruction of their crop. John came outside to join her, gathering his thoughts as he assessed the damage. If it is all across the country, I don't know what we can do, for we are all ruined. We will manage somehow, she said, resting against him. We are strong and good workers. That has to count for something. It will count for nothing when the landlord sends his men for the rent or when the children cry with hunger pains in their bellies. Don't say such a thing. It's the truth. John sounded utterly forlorn. In all the years she had loved him and slept beside him and borne his children, Mary had never heard such despair in his voice. Her husband was the one who usually rallied her when she felt low or worried or was tired out from the children. John Sullivan, I will not have you speak like that. We will do what we need to survive. I will not have us put out of this cottage and off the land or see our children go hungry. His blue eyes held hers and she could tell he sensed her fury. Oh, you're right. We must act quickly and make ready for the hungry months ahead. The Sullivans have always fought for this place and I'll not be the one to give it up to Ricks and Betcher or anyone else. Relief washed over Mary and she took his rough hand in hers. Aren't we a grand pair, John said, leaning over and kissing her gently, as if they hadn't a care in the world. She felt overwhelmed with emotion momentarily. They both knew well that this time, with no animals or possessions to sell, terrible times lay ahead. But at least they were together. So that's getting you into the big fight that lies ahead for them all. So um, it's an important part of the book. But um, I just loved, um, I wanted them to fight back and do everything in their power to fight back. And um, in the story, the book story, is how they do fight back and, 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 and manage to survive. It is an important message because sometimes when we're taught about the famine, it's that people went like lambs to the slaughter. They just lay down and died. Yeah, well, you see, I, I actually thought that too, Martina, because that's what we had learned, you know, but actually they didn't. You know, um, the men went on the roadworks and as I said, they rioted and came into town. Um, they sold everything they possessed, they, every. They didn't even have blankets, they had no coats for the snow. They sold everything they had. And um, the women worked on the roadworks as well. And the children, they, they foraged, they scrounged everything they could. Um, they fought tooth and nail to survive. And I want tooth and nail. I wonder if that's why we have so few possessions, belongings from our great grandmothers, you know, passed through generations. No, they, they, everything was pawned and sold. Mm -hmm. And um, so they, they would have had, I mean, that gen unless you were from a well-off family, you know, uh, you know, the big house or, or a very upper family, um, anyone who had been in, in, affected by, by it would have sold everything, clothing, jewellery, um, furniture, Everything was sold and destroyed. And, um, you know, they were even burning furniture for, for firewood during the time that the weather was so bad. And um, then, of course, then, you know, stuff was destroyed because when they got famine fever, then if blankets and stuff and clothes were burnt and got rid of, the, if they had any, but most of them didn't have any. So um, there was very little left. I mean, the things that survived are things like the fact of being some 
cauldrons, big salmon pots and things like that. But very little has survived from that class of people during the famine. Only big house stuff has survived, but 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 that that those people, tenants, poor tenants, um, very little has survived. Or and that most of them couldn't read or write. Um, they weren't literate, or they were barely literate. A lot of them. So there wasn't, you know, books or, or letters. And there are some letters, and there's accounts of their, you know, what they paid for their land and things like that. The rents and things like rent books and things like that survive. But there isn't a lot there left for people to see. Some of the landlords, of course, also sold possessions to feed people, and that's gone as race memory. You know, good landlords like the Gore Booths in uh, yeah, yeah, the, uh, yes, there were all the people down in West Cork and the Barrys and, and all that that they they did actually try and help, mm-hmm. and and some of them ran soup kitchens from their own houses from the big house, and then and, the, then the the minister, and a lot of the ministers, oh. Protestant ministers, they actually um you know ran soup kitchens. Robert Trial and Skull, Zeph and his wife set up a soup kitchen and skull which were feeding hundreds and hundreds of people and unfortunately he got famine fever picked it up with the soup kitchen and administering to the sick and skull and he he died himself too and what about the northern part of the country do you know much about the famine? The northern part of the country that was affected too but it, I don't think it was affected probably Donegal was but the northern part doesn't seem to be I think well, from what I've read it's more down south but like Roscommon everywhere really was affected Monaghan Man- everywhere was affected Bar you start coming in towards du- you know Dublin and Kildare and all that that area wasn't as bad you know but um, you see it was wherever there were people dependent on the land and dependent on the potato crop and um, that's where it affected so if they, the they, north, they other kind of farming they weren't badly affected you know the north was more industrialised with yes the yeah industry. yeah yeah, and yeah. the thing, the awful thing was that the lack, but you know, food was still being grown, but it was being exported. And in the book, I found that so hard because um, you know ships were coming in with with grain and that to, for brewing, and brewing was still going on. Daniel O'Connell had begged them to stop the brewing to keep the grain in Ireland to feed people, but brewing was still going on. All the big breweries were still in operation, and um, food was being exported because Ireland was feeding Liverpool and Manchester and London, and food was all being exported from Ireland to feed the industrial cities of England. Um, well, Ireland still produces more food than it needs. It's an excellent... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, but that was, that was terrible. And to see that actually happening must have been horrific for people to yeah. see food going out when they had nothing. Just terrible. It's a wonder people didn't riot and uh, storm the. Well, they did. They did. They did try to to, to take stuff off boats, and they did try and steal stuff and everything. But they were always heavily guarded by 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 army and soldiers and that. Yeah, firepower. Um, speaking of the north of the country, a stage version of Under the Hawthorn Tree was produced by Cahoots Northern Ireland, um, a children's theatre company uh, led by our ma man, Paul McAnini, and it toured uh, the country very successfully before in lockdown. You got in in the nick of time, Marita. Yeah, well, Paul um, Paul McAnini uh, is from Armagh, but he's an amazing director. And I had heard a little bit about Cahoots and then actually um, the, 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 they wanted to do the play in the Ameri- Ulster American Folk Park in um, in, in uh, oh, my, yeah, oh, my yeah. Time. yeah, and um, to, uh, but it's amazing because I actually researched Wildflower Girl in the Ulster American Folk Park when it just opened. I went up and that's helped me with researching a uh, Wildflower Girl. And I've always had a connection with them. And over the years, I've done lots of events there and different things. And in actual fact, a lot of the younger people in schools that come to the Ulster American Folk Park, they always think the folk park is kind of um, the theme park to go with onto the Hawthorne Tree and Wildflower Girl. So they actually started off doing a week here or there. They'd have, you know, um, Hawthorne Days. But then Hawthorne Days became more than a week. It became a month and it became a lot more. So um, the kids who go have usually read the book and, and the, the books and they, 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 they pick out the parts that are relevant to them in the park. So the Ulster American Folk Park said to me they wanted to dramatise parts of the book and put it on stage in the folk park. So I said yes. So um, Paul was involved with doing that with Cahoots. And I met them. And then Paul said to me, I think he, they had dramatised and put on the American in the folk park, which I went up to see. And then they said, look, we think we'd like to develop it even more and make it a big stage play. So 
so um, I said, that's great. So I met Cahoots and then I met Charles Way, who adapted it for the stage because I'm not used to adapting stuff for the stage. And he had adapted a lot of really good stuff for the stage and worked a lot with Cahoots. He's a very nice man. He's English. And um, so then I, they involved me. So I was back and forward to the Mac Theatre with rehearsals and if there's any little changes needed. And they got a fantastic composer, Gert McConaughey, and choreographer and um, amazing cast. And suddenly it grew to this really, really good production that you know, could be really proud of. And um, so it opened in the Mac there about two years ago and it sold out run, like absolutely packed out. And then they said they were going to tour, they were going to do it again. So we came back to the Mac there in January, about two weeks. And then it went on a tour around Ireland. And um, it was in Cork Opera House, Wexford Opera House, a few places. And ended up actually in the theatre we we're meant to be in, in our man, the market theatre. And I actually you saw it there. Moment. And I actually saw it there. And um, literally that was on the last date was the 29th of February. And the lockdown came on the 12th of March. But actually 29th of February, it kind of also, the, not just the end of the whole century, the first person I think died of COVID in Ireland. So, um I was so lucky and um, it had played to packed houses and um, great response from adults and children who went to see it and everybody. So I was very proud of it and they did an amazing production. But we're, we're hoping, fingers crossed, you know, um, that they're talking about, talking about later next year, it will come back again. Um, because a lot of theatres want it back, but they want it for longer runs and also the talk of it going abroad to, to maybe the US and China and places like that. So um, we're, we're keeping our fingers crossed that because God knows where we'll all be next year. But um, they did a great, 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 great adaptation of it. And um, I was very pleased with it. And, you know, most people say, oh God, they ruined my book if they did something. But they didn't. They did a really good thing. And I remember going to the rehearsals and just you know, all the cast were there and Paul and that and Charles and they were all obviously watching me, my reaction when I first saw it and I just started crying, you know, and um, so I kind of knew that they got me. That crying they, in a they, good way. They're crying in a good way. It was very emotional <laughs> seeing Ali, Michael and Peggy like on, on stage and, and their story and um, Charles just did a great job adapting it and Paul is an amazing director. Like he just has this magic touch about directing and um, it's amazing because it's been seen by adults and children and just it just really has done very, very well. I'm very, very pl proud of it and pleased with it. So will that be back on tour when we're alive? Uh, I don't know, whatever. Mm -hmm. I don't think it'll be till later in 2021 now, but um, we'll see. But that, I, I don't know, everything's up in the air now so we have no idea what's going to happen but um, it's a really good production so hopefully eventually it will, it will resurface again so what's next for you marisa and um, well i'm working on a new children's book and then i'm going into another adult book and uh, so a few things i want to do and um just uh, living my life and um i keep saying i'm not doing another big historical book but i don't uh, believe you <laughs> I know, I know, that's what, that's what my publishers say as well. But the, the children's book I'm doing is not historical anyway, totally. And um, so you know, I want to do lots of things. I have all young grandchildren. I want to write stories for them too. And um, do you I read your books to them? or Oh, I do. I, I do. I have The house is awash with books. I mean, someday the whole static and ceiling is going to come down with all the books. It was so full of books and stories. And there, the last few weeks I've had my... Um, Little, my daughter pipes burst in her house and herself and her little boy Max and her husband and the baby twins had to move in with us. So um, Max is going to bed at night and they sometimes mum would bring him or dad would bring him to bed. And so I want granny to bring and I always pick out a few books to read and have stories, you know, and uh, he's a great little fellow. So um, I, have, I have wonderful grandchildren and they're all around me. I have eight grandchildren so far and uh, so I love having stories for them and talking to them and telling them stories and, uh, and they tell me stories stories too which is great so um no I, I writing for children will always be there for me so I want to just constantly do a bit of writing for children before I go into a big adult book again and um, but I can't to be honest Martina I can't imagine a time I won't be writing I may not be being published mm -hmm. but I love writing and I, I just love writing so um I always have a story in my head I always have two or three books I want to do and but as you know I, I just keep my head down and I keep it might take me a year or two to do them but I keep my head down I keep going going doing it how many books has it been now oh golly I'd say we must be up around 30 I don't know at least any I don't know and then I'm working on another one or two so I, I don't know and I do one book at a time so I've done a lot of books and um, between you lose count yourself Marita you just get yeah. I think so, I think so because I you know I'm one of these people I don't everything how many pages is a book and what's your word count and I am 
disaster <laughs> at numbers and figures. At school, I was terrible at maths. I didn't even do maths. My <laughs> leaving cert. So I, I don't. I couldn't even remember a phone number, my car number. <laughs> if I had to do my insurance policy, I have to look out and see the car and the driver. I said, "What the hell is my number?" You know, if I was stopped by the police, I wouldn't have to tell my own number. I'm very bad on numbers, so I never know numbers or anything. So I couldn't tell you. Um, you know, people say, "Oh, I word count how many pages I write a day." I never word count, um, I ne- could never tell you how many pages are in any of my books. Um, I'm looking behind you, though, and I can see, well, I've been in your house, so I know there are a lot of books anyway. Yeah. I can see books there. Have you any little hawthorn trees about? Because it's I, have, I have, I have, yeah, I, actually, I think there's, there's one on me. <laughs> Do you see it? Yes, <laughs> and I have, I have a hawthorn picture here beside me. I have um, a ho- two hawthorns. I have hawthorn, two hawthorns on my windowsill. I have another hawthorn over there. I have a cover of under the hawthorn tree here. I'm surrounded by them in the house. I'm surrounded by them. So it's it's the fairy tree, isn't it? The hawthorn. Yes, tree. it is. Yeah, and uh, I've 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 great superstition. I believe about, and I think that's why the book was so lucky because I originally heard about three little skeletons found under buried under a hawthorn tree and they were cutting down the hawthorn tree and um, so a radio news item wasn't it yeah it was a news item, thing on the radio and um, but I just was haunted by it and that's how I wrote the story of Eileen Michael and Peggy these three but I didn't have I didn't I, the story about three skeletons but I, I saw three living little skinny children standing up going to walk on this journey and um, but I remember when I wrote the book um, the story I wrote for my daughter first was ever going to be published and then when I did give it to my publisher the one thing he wanted to do was to change the title and he said no one will buy a book called Under the Hawthorn Tree I said well, he what? proved him wrong didn't no, he no 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 he said no it's a terrible name and I said oh well, no but I heard the story about this Hawthorn Tree and the three little skeletons found under it he said no no we're going to change the name and everything's a book about tree gardening to and, uh, but then what, what happened was what do you remember what? What did they want to call it? Uh, they want to call it Children of the Famine, which is kind of the second title of it. Mm. So anyway, but then what happened, my American publisher had read the manuscript and they were buying it for America. And um, so my publisher was talking to the American publisher and they said, oh, look, just to let you know. And I had, I was having a big fight with him about it. And I said, and he said, we'll, call, we'll put it under the hawthorn tree in the back cover with a little picture of a hawthorn tree, but it's not going to be called that. And then my American publisher actually came in and said, well, actually, do you know something for America? We love that title under the Hawthorne tree. So they said, look, if you want to change it for Ireland and the rest of the world, fine. But in America, we're, we're sticking with under the Hawthorne tree. It's a really good name for the book because the Hawthorne tree goes through the book. Mm. So um, so then my publisher said, well, actually, you know something, maybe now that isn't that bad an idea for a title for a book. So um, and it so came back to under the Hawthorne tree with the beautiful Donald Tesk illustrations on the front. And then... Um, it's been the luckiest book title because everywhere I've gone in the world and every talk I've done about the book, um, it's always raised about under the Hawthorne tree. And I always tell the story of these three little skeletons found under a Hawthorne tree. And I really think there's a little bit of magic in it. And I feel even in the book, there's a bit of magic. And I think it's from, from that. It sounds crazy. I probably have to sound like a crazy writer now, but um, maybe I am a crazy writer. I probably I am, am. <laughs> in fairness now. But I do think that magic element of the Hawthorne tree, the fairy tree, has somehow brought its, ma- its own magic to the story and, and the wonderful things that's happened with the book because wonderful things happened with the book and it has changed my life totally. Well, on that note, We'll have to thank you, Marita, for your time. It's been such a pleasure. Can I remind our audience that Under the Hawthorn Tree, um, The Hungry Road, Revel Sisters, The Magdalene, all of Marita's books are available um, through the festival bookseller, No Alibis of Belfast. That's such a fabulous shop. I love popping in there. It, uh, Marita's books can be bought online or by telephone from No Alibis. Um, and thanks also to our funders, the Arts Council and Armagh City, Banbridge and Craig Avon Borough Council. It's been such a pleasure talking to Marita. It's been great that the John Hewitt Summer School did take place this year uh, in the this format, but next year we'll be back in the marketplace in Armagh and at other venues. Join us then. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody.